Good evening. Tonight's forum is being brought to you by the League of Women Voters of Alameda, which is a 501c3 corporation run entirely by volunteers and dedicated to the education of voters. I'm Susan Hauser, serving as president of this chapter, and I want to thank you for being with us tonight for this Propositions and Ballot Measures Forum. Our action committee has been working very, very hard to develop reasoned, thoughtful pros and cons for the local measures. Just a few housekeeping items to cover. This forum is being recorded and will be available on our website, lwvalameda.org. Audio and video are off for the audience. In other words, you will not be visible to others and your audio is muted. We will not be taking questions for this forum. On a more somber note, the passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is having a profound effect on many of us. We're mourning the loss of a formidable, formidable women's and civil rights advocate who pushed through many barriers during her career because of her belief in justice and the power of the rule of law. We open with perspective this week from Stephanie Dute, Executive Director of the League of Women Voters of California, who wrote a tribute about the late justice's impact. Dute discussed how Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death is an opportunity to extend her legacy and persevere during a time of difficulty in our nation. To quote her, I encourage you to take the time you need to feel what this loss means to you. And when you are ready to wipe away the tears, pick up the torch, be inspired. Imagine the future that can be if we all keep pushing. Pick up her legacy, be fiercely determined. Never forget that a five foot one inch tall woman was a giant who changed the world. And we can keep that spirit alive. Before we move along in our program, I'd like to ask everyone to please take a moment of silence in the memory of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Breonna Taylor. Now, I'd like to introduce Karen Butter, Action Committee Chairperson, who will introduce the presenters this evening. Karen? Thanks, Susan. Um, tonight, we want to report on four measures, Alameda City Measure AA, Alameda City Measure Z, Alameda County Measure W, and the State Proposition 15, one of the 12 state propositions. Anna Crane will cover Measure A, I will cover Z and W, and Bill Smith will talk about Prop 15. Additionally, I will mention the League of Women Voters Alameda campaign finance reports where you can track candidate and issue expenditures. Um, I wanna give you a little bit of background about um, the, the measures and how we went about preparing the material. Um, these are um, nonpartisan analysis of the propositions. In order to do that, we analyze the ballot statements, we analyze the arguments for and against, and the rebuttals, and when available, statements from candidate committees and campaign, I'm sorry, campaign committees. We also talked with people to try to understand ballot statements. We did not verify campaign statements, however. Before I turn it over to Anna, I want to uh, mention uh, some criteria for evaluate, evaluating ballot measures because I know you, like I am, beginning to receive a lot of material both by email, social media, and in the, the U.S. postal mail. So here are some criteria to consider when you are examining um, the material that you get. So who is endorsing or opposing the candidate or the ballot measure? Who are the major financial contributors? 
does the material contain personal attacks, ridicule the candidates, contain statements that cannot be verified, or employ scare tactics? Who sent the published materials? The candidate or an unknown or poorly identified source? And are you receiving a large number of mailing pieces or other communications attacking a candidate or ballot measure? Finally, are sponsors clearly identified as individuals or just as committees? So these are some things that you need to consider when you're looking at material that you receive um, regarding either candidates or measures. Now I want to turn it over to Anna Crane who will talk about uh, Alameda City Measure AA. Anna? Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to share my screen in just a second and we'll put up some of the key points about Measure AA. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Well then, um, I'm having a little bit of problems uh, putting the slideshow on because this thing, there we go. Okay. All right. Measure AA is a charter amendment that has been proposed by the City Council to change several of the provisions of the City's charter, charter. The basic question that Measure AA asks is, shall the measure amending the City Charter to clarify the prohibition against members of the City Council interfering with the City Manager authorize the city attorney to prosecute state law misdemeanors and amend outdated provisions, including gender neutral language. That measure says a lot of things together in one item. I'm going to go into a little more detail about what this is all about in just a moment. The situation. The city charter was adopted in 1937 and what we have is a city council manager form of government. The city manager is in charge of all administrative functions. The city council, on the other hand, establishes policy, passes ordinance, it actually appropriates the funds and develops an overall plan and policy for the city. The city charter prohibits the city council and mayor from interfering in administrative functions in the city. In, in 2019, the City Council created the City Prosecutor's Office. The City Prosecutor can now prosecute all violations of city ordinances, but it requires permission from the District Attorney if he is to prosecute state violations. Across the state, the uh, District Attorneys tend to focus more on serious crimes on the felonies. Misdemeanors, therefore, are a second thought. And the idea of this charter amendment is it would empower the city attorney to be the officer of first account to actually take these misdemeanors to court. The uh, state attorney general would retain the right to overrule the city attorney on decisions. The proposal ballot measure specifically prohibits interference with the city manager's duties by city council members. They have to work through the city manager for all administrative functions. Violations of this provision will be prosecuted and if convicted, the council member would be removed from office. The city attorney would have the authority to prosecute those violations. 
The proposal will expand the city attorney's authority to prosecute all misdemeanor violations that occur within the city of Alameda. In addition, the proposal deletes language that was considered obsolete, language that would remove an officer from the city by if they were physically absent for 30 days, for more than 30 days without permission of the council. It, it removes a requirement that certain appointments be made between May 1st and July 1st and had travel reimbursement and hours of operation, things that really uh, was felt did not belong in the city charter because they're handled by administrative procedures. And it changes all the personal pronouns to gender neutral. So instead of saying the city attorney, if they refer to the city attorney as he, referring to it as the city attorney, or if need be, there, they or there. The people have very differing opinions about these propositions. The supporters say it clarifies the role and responsibilities of the city council, city manager, and city attorney. It replaces outdated gender terminology. Uh, the people who support this say that the city attorney knows the community better than the county district attorney and can employ prosecutorial discretion. The district attorney and the state attorney general may still prosecute if the city attorney declines or if there's a conflict of interest. The supporters who came out in favor of this were Marilyn S. E. Ashcroft, the mayor of the city of Alameda, John Knox White, the vice mayor, Jim Odie, council member, and Molly Avella, council member, city of Alameda. The cons, opponents say, there are too many issues having nothing to do with one another in one ballot measure. The measure requires the hiring of another city attorney amid budget constraints. There is the possibility for improper influence on the city attorney's office by elected officials since those officials hire and fire the city attorney. The current prosecutorial system has worked for decades and the proponents have not uh, justified the added expense. However, where there are, we have no names of opponents listed. I, I think this proposition is uh, deserving of careful consideration and as one of many on your ballot. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. So now I'm going to talk about Alameda City Measure Z. And um, I know that you've seen lots of lawn signs and lots of articles and letters to the editor about it. Um, so I will go through it and give you the basics. Um, and then you can decide uh, how you want to vote on it. So there are really two questions. This is a, an amendment to the city charter. Um, the question is, shall the city charter be amended to repeal um, the prohibition against building multifamily housing? And sa shall the city charter and general plan be amended to repeal the limit limitations on one housing unit per 2,000 square feet? Um, Um, the situation then, in 1973, as some of you who were here then remember, Article 26 was added to the city charter, known as Measure A, to prohibit the construction of multifamily housing. And again, in 1991, Article 26 and the general plan were amended to limit the maximum density of residential development to one unit per 2,000 square feet of land. And these requirements were also added to the city's zoning ordinance. The proposal then would add a provision to the city of Alameda general plan to repeal the limit for residential development to one housing unit for 2,000 square feet. So that would be taken out of the general plan. Um, it would also repeal the restriction on construction of multifamily housing units. So those could now be built. The fiscal effect, though, is that it would increase city revenues 
from fees paid by developers for, for permitting a known unknown but greater number of new homes. It could also increase the sales tax revenue from commercial and shopping districts. And it could improve access to state funds to address critical city needs such as safe streets, quality schools, and the possible threat of sea level rise caused by climate crisis. It also removes administrative costs for workarounds to comply with state regulations. So what do the supporters say? They say that city compliance with evolving state laws will be adaptable to changing conditions if these are repealed. They also say that Measure A is illegal and not in compliance with state laws. They say that the historic preservation ordinance, which protects homeowners and their neighborhoods, will remain. And commercial property owners will be able to add housing to make redevelopment feasible. They also say that the state will make more funds available for affordable housing. And the repeal will remove the historic implications of zoning laws that enshrine red line, exclusion, and discrimination. The supporters include Mayor Marilyn Ezzie Ashcraft, City of Alameda, uh, California State Assembly Member Rob Bonta, former senior pastor at Buena Vista United Methodist Church, Michael Yoshi, and Alameda County Supervisor, Wilma Chan. And you can get more information from the supporters at www.yesonmeasurez.com. So what do the opponents say? They say that it's going to increase financial incentives to demolish housing and replace it with high density housing and increase traffic congestion. They also say that the repeal will not significantly address the affordable housing shortage. They say state law gives us the flexibility to meet our housing requirements with multifamily homes without making these changes. And that protecting neighborhoods from overcrowding would be subject to the ever-changing city councils. The opponents include former mayor, city of Alameda, Beverly Johnson, former president, Alameda NAACP, Marvin Lyons, Alameda city council member, Tony Daysog, and realtor, Walt Jacobs. And for more information, you can find it at welovealameda.com. So that's the information about um, measure Z. Now I want to talk just briefly about the League of Women Voters of Alameda initiative for campaign finance review. And I hope that many of you will go and take a look at this if you haven't seen it already. Um, what we have tried to do is to help you understand who's supporting the measures and candidates in Alameda. And candidates and issues are required to declare contributions, large and small, several times during the election cycle. And this information is all available on the city clerk's website. So what we know from looking at the data is that in 2018 city council race, five candidates raised a combined total of over $200,000. We also know that for Measure K, almost $37 was raised for each vote cast for that measure. We have been preparing charts and tables for the city elections since 2018, and you can find this on our website. Um, this is the URL, but it's under the um, Alameda Campaign Finance uh, section. So this is an example of the types of charts that we have on the website, and it makes it very easy to see the data. So here you can see how much was raised by location for the Friends of Crab Cove and We Care Alameda, and using the charts and the, or using the colors and the charts um, displays the data very clearly. Another example is for city candidates, and this is contributions by size. And so again, we've color coded it so you can see um, the contributions under $100, the contributions from $100 to $999 in yellow, and the contributions over $1,000 in purple. What we're working on right now is to compile the data from the last report, which was, I think, um, closed last week or this early this week. And so we should have the data for all of the, um, local, the two local ballot measures and all of the Alameda city candidates up and online next week. So please go to the website and look at all of the data. 
And then the information will be updated on a uh, much more frequent basis um, up towards uh, the election. And there's one, I think, even uh, just a few days before the election. And then the final report uh, comes in January, so you can look at all of the money that went in for elections. So this is a really valuable resource that's available um, on the League of Women Voters website. So now I want to go to Alameda County Measure W, which I think probably many people have not heard about, but it will be on the ballot and it will, if passed, uh, increase sales tax. So the question is, um, should an ordinance be adopted to establish a half percent sales tax for 10 years? And the sales tax is um, designed to maintain and improve essential county services that would include housing and services for those experiencing homelessness, mental health services, health services, job training, social safety net, and other general services. It was expected to generate $150 million a year with annual audits and citizens oversight. So that's the question. So the situation is that homelessness in Alameda County has doubled over the last four years, and the lack of affordable housing is the primary driver of this crisis particularly when coupled with the growing economic in, uh, inequality and insufficient access to various services. Alameda County established Vision 2020 to set goals to eliminate home, homelessness. And in 2016, we approved Measure A1 to authorize the sale of up to $580 million in general obligation bonds for the construction and renovation of affordable housing. The county anticipates that there will be significant reductions in revenue due to the COVID-19 shutdown. And in fact, in May 2020, they forecast that there would be as much as a 10% drop in sales tax revenue. Um, as you may remember, the sales tax currently in Alameda City is 9.75%. In March 2020, a new sales tax of 0.5% was approved to fund early childhood and education services, which was Measure C, but the vote for that is under court challenge, so the tax is not being collected, and it's expected that it will be several months um, before um, we know whether the tax can actually be implemented. So the proposal establishes an additional half percent sales and use tax effective for 10 years from April 2021 to March 31, 2031. The proceeds go into the county's general fund and can be used for general purposes. However, the Board of Supervisors intends to allocate funds from the measure to maintain and improve central county services that have been prioritized in the Vision 2026 campaign, which includes uh, support for those experiencing homeless, mental health services, job training, social safety net, and other services. A citizens oversight committee appointed by the Board of Supervisors will review the expenditures for Measure W funds to ensure that they are appropriate and there will be annual audits, audits by independent certified public account accountants. The Measure W fund was anticipated to produce about 150 million annually, but the actual figure will be much less. And another fiscal effect is that there are no restrictions on the funds. <coughs> are going into the county's general purpose fund. The ballot measure resolution gives direction, but the funds can be used for other purposes, most notably in the case of fiscal emergencies. So what do the supporters say? They say that Alameda County should allocate as many resources as possible to helping people avoid homelessness. And the economic downturn created by COVID-19 has exacerbated the homeless crisis. And Measure W will assist not only those who are experiencing homelessness, but those at most risk for becoming homeless. And it expands the shelter and street-based assistance. And this is the URL, www.hometogether2020.org. The opponents say that sales tax are regressive. This additional tax will further strain individuals during an unprecedented health and economic crisis. And that the sales tax through Alameda County and Alameda City is already one of the highest in the state. And calling this tax for homelessness services is misleading since proceeds can go into the general fund and have no limitation on usage. So that's an overview of Measure um, WW. 
And now I will turn it to Bill Smith, who will talk about um, Prop 15. Uh, thank you, Karen. And I'll sh share my screen here momentarily and to get going on this. Okay, can you share, have I shared my screen? No. Oh, it covered up something. Let me try, try again. Okay, what is happening? It worked well when we practiced beforehand. Um, I'll start to, again, let me close that out. I think it's working now, Bill. Okay, so let me start uh, my slideshow. Thank you, everyone, for your patience there. So tonight I'm going to be talking about the uh, uh, the League of Women Voters Proposition 15. I'd like to begin with a disclosure uh, regarding that. Uh, this has been the top priority for several years for the state of California, League of Women Voters, to get behind. And so I've worked and others have worked very hard to keep this a balanced pros and cons. And I'd like to explain again the structure and the mission of the uh, League of Women Voters. We, we are to empower democracy, and we have two roles that we do that. We have voter service and education, in the role tonight, we also have adv advocacy. And that is not my role tonight. Mine is to inform and give you a balanced view of the uh, proposition. And Proposition 15, will uh, change the way the property tax, commercial property taxes are collected in the state for uh, larger owners of business, uh, businesses and uh, <clears throat> owners of a large business and, uh, resident and, and commercial property, business property. Okay, so in the next slide, we'll see that uh, Prop Proposition 15 is called the Taxes on Commercial Property. It's an, an initiative constitutional amendment uh, that over two million dollars, uh, two million signatures were collected for it to get it on the ballot. The more, uh, majority approval is required. It increases funding sources by six point five billion dollars to eleven point five billion dollars annually for public schools, community colleges, local government services, and does that by changing the tax assessment of commercial property and industrial property. And uh, the tax basis, the change in the tax assessment, it changes the tax basis, not the tax rates, the basis. So that's the amount that the, the value of the property is determined at. And the, currently it's based on the purchase price. And this has been since 1978. And some of you may have heard of Proposition 13. That's what sent it then. So after Prop 15 should uh, Prop 15 pass, that the uh, commercial property greater than commercial industrial property worth more than $3 million will be assessed at market value. And so the impacts on property owners are listed in this slide. For residential property, there's no direct impact. A little later on, we'll talk about the possible in indirect impact. For all businesses, regardless of size, reduces their taxes on business equipment. And that's, for example, uh, like uh, computers and printers and uh, tools for skilled tradespeople. And then if the uh, if a owner has more than three or owner or business owns more than three million dollars of commercial property, it will increase the tax to the market value. It'll be reassessed roughly once every three years. Now the, the next two slides I have are for those of you who like to get into details or the, the basics of property taxes. They're not really necessary to understand what it will do, but it does provide detail uh, a little bit uh, uh, for you to estimate how it might impact you. Uh, for the rest of you, just slow, slow through these two slides. We'll come back and summarize them again 
uh, at, at on the third slide. So how is all property taxed now? That's both residential and commercial. It's taxed on the value of the property at purchase. And then a small annual increase in that value is capped at 2% each year. And that increase in assessed value has usually been less than an increase in market value. There's just been a couple of times in 78 when property prices have decreased and you've actually been able to get your property reassessed and taxes reduced, but you had to do that manually to do that. The tax rate is capped at 1% of the assessed value plus voter approved rates. And since Prop 13 passed in 1978, there's been more and more of these individual tax, uh, uh, tax measures to, in, to do a, small, a smaller voter approved rate uh, to get, add to your property taxes. We've had some of those here in Alameda as well. And then there's a formula that distributes the tax receipts to local governments and schools. So what it's gonna be like should Proposition 15 pass? So then the most important thing is that there will be a $3 minimum ownership by people or businesses that will trigger the change. So you won't uh, be affected if you're less than, if you own less than that. Uh, on market value of the property now, and then, then the base will be on the property value of the, of the market value of the property now. And so that made major changes in the property tax assessor's office to reassess properties more frequently. And that's more uh, common around the, the other states that already do that. Uh, there will be no small annual increases based on purchase price. Right now that was that uh, capped at about 2% for the uh, annual purchase uh, increase. And it does lower taxes on business equipment. And the formula for distributing tax receipts are unchanged. And for many of us here in the, on, on the stage in the audience, that means no change for residential homes, rented or owned. So whether we're a renter or we're owner, or we're an owner of rental properties, uh, we, uh, the, the, this will not affect us. It, it exempts residential property taxes. So in summary, you may recognize this slide. Again, uh, it impacts on property owners, residential, no direct impacts, all businesses, they get reduced taxes on business equipment, so it'll actually be a tax reduction for the smaller businesses. And then if you do, if, uh, if you are an owner or your business owns more than $3 million of commercial property, your taxes will increase, and that increase will be phased in and happen over a, a number of years. And uh, Okay, and so now the, the next slide will talk about where is that extra money going to be and how much money is there to be distributed. So that's the revenue distribution. So there will be a total of $7 million to $14 million going to Alameda entities, to the city itself. Uh, on a statewide basis, it's going to be $6.5 to $11.5 billion. So uh, that's the amount we're talking about there. The city of Alameda, itself will get 3.5 to $7 million. You know, that's so variable because it depends on how, what, how much property is tax is collected that year. And this year, for instance, property tax collections have been delayed somewhat because of the COVID. And uh, Alameda Unified, the school district will get about three to $6 million, a little less than both. And then a number of other small schools in the city will get around $100,000 each. So that's where the the money is going. So what are uh, people for and people against this measure saying? The people for it are saying that wealth com wealthy companies and business property owners should pay property taxes based on what their holdings are really worth. Uh, taxes from Prop Proposition 15 will help pay for important public services such as schools and fire departments. People against it say Raising taxes will increase the cost of everything that people buy, including food, gas, and health care. And uh, that's why I qualified it for residential businesses earlier, the impact uh, in residential residents earlier, the, the, the could be an indirect impact, although there is no direct impact. And Proposition 15 will hurt small businesses that are struggling during the, the uh, current pandemic. So you heard that uh, Karen mentioned how important it is to know who contributed to, to the campaign. And the yes on Prop 15 campaign has raised more money than the no of $40 million to about uh, 28, almost $30 million. And the yes on proposition funding has primarily come from uh, 
uh, teachers associations and the labor unions, uh, California's Teachers Association, the California Federation of Teachers, SEIU, and a number of community foundations, San Francisco and California community have also contributed as well. On the NOAA Proposition 15, the California Business Roundtable is by far the biggest contributor, $13.5 million, but there have been a lot of other contributors too. California Taxpayers Association, Business Properties Association, uh, Next Era Energy, uh, and then the Columbia Trust Fund. And an interesting one is the, uh, 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 California, the uh, California Farm Bureau for Agricultural Interests. So in summary, the questions that you need to ask yourself, it really boils down to two. One, do, com do, you, do communities and schools need more funding? And if they do, then should that funding come from large property owners? If your answer to both of these questions is yes, then you vote yes on Proposition 15. If your answer to either question is no, then you probably might want to consider voting no on Prop 15 to maintain the status quo. My next slide tells you a little bit about the events that we've had, all the election forms that uh, we've had, and uh, Susan may tell us a little bit more about them later in our upcoming forum, the Nuts and Bolts uh, Policing in Alameda as well. And you can find on our, uh, on our uh, frequently asked questions for, uh, excuse me, uh, on the voters ads for Prop 15 and others, you can find the, the uh, kind of state websites for both the No on 15 and the Yes on 15 campaigns. You can also just search for those to get to their websites. Okay. Susan, it's yours. I'll unshare. Um, okay. Again, please visit our website, lwvalameda.org, where you can find opportunities to donate treasure and time, as well as more information on the upcoming election. As Bill mentioned, we will host two town halls next week, one on September 30th and one on October 1st. The topic is Nuts and Bolts, Policing in Alameda. Both of these will start at 7 p.m. and you can register on our website and watch anytime after seven, where you may also, on the website, join the league, donate and find lots of information on all things related to voting. Thank you all for joining us this evening and please remember to register and vote. I urge you to check out VotersEdge.org for in-depth information about what is on your ballot. For information about the state propositions, you may also wish to visit CalMatters.org for short one-minute videos on each of the state propositions. And at the end of this program, there will be links to connect you to register to vote, to learn more about the state ballot propositions, as well as a link to our town halls on policing in Alameda. Thank you very much. <laughs>